What's going on everybody? Gunner here. Uh, today is all about tying the articulated imposter, aka the mega jerk. Let's do this. This coaster is literally like the funniest thing on the planet. Uh, this was designed by Bam Bam Fly Guy. Dude's got the craziest, sickest decals on the planet, like a musky, small mouth, and a pike, because everybody who watches this channel knows warm water is where it is at. Now, <clears throat> aside from a little bit of promotion there, what we're going to do today is we're going to tie an imposter articulated version. We're literally just going to scale it up. Now, the Mega Jerk for me was like a, a evolution and dubbing brush design because understand the context of, of how the fly progressed and understand uh, where the industry was at at the time. Basically, there wasn't really predator dubbing brushes, right? So I talked about this in the imposter video about how and why I really dove into that and started to create my own brushes in a predator scale based off of a Larry Dahlberg video. Now, the Mega Jerk had this really cool idea of scaling a brush volume-wise proportional to where it would go on a hook and basically taking a brush putting it on a rear hook and a front hook with a head and you're done. That was the Mega Jerk. So if you want to check out the original with the dubbing brush, you can check out this video here and kind of give this one some context. But what I'm going to show you guys how to do today is really tie it without the brush. And we're going to follow uh, and basically create the same finished product using the same techniques outlined in the Imposter, which is really just stack and pack. Distributing materials in the round using small core material dams, which provide friction on the hook provide lift for a long wing, which is going to create your action silhouette and taper, fiber selection for that wing so that it's stiff, low friction, but limp relative to its length. That's a key feature, relative to its length. So you don't want to come in with something super limp like Icelandic sheep because it'll distort and not and get fouled, but you don't want to come in with something so stiff that it doesn't have action, like Supreme Hair at that length per se, right? So they have different nuances. We're going to come in with the big fly fiber straight per the imposter video, which has that perfect line of stiffness to limpness at that full length, nice and wispy, um, and it's in the round, so it's very low friction. Anyway, and I'm gonna show you how to scale that up, because obviously we're taking this an eight inch pattern and scaling it up, which this is, you know, maybe seven inches of silhouette with a little flash tail, and we're gonna scale that up to 10, 11 inches, right? So you're gonna have something truly appropriate for your, your musky perch relationships, a lot of still water, musky perch, shallow, weedy lakes. That's going to be your predominant uh, stuff, especially up in northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin. But also things like lake tulipy or herring or what have you, even a sucker if you, if you tied a bulkhead version, right? And so it's going to just give you the same material set scaled up for more forage options and different size profiles, which can also... <coughs> which can also be applicable for certain times of the year, right? So really cool because imposter being a fantastic springtime pattern, typically smaller baits, moving up into mid to late summer, kind of getting into fall, moving into your artic articulated realm, larger profile baits, moving into a mega jerk, but it's the same materials. That's what's really cool. So I'm going to show you guys how to do this. Um, let's jump into some basics here, but I'm going to show you guys how to articulate this with two six outs so this is the six out predator stinger hook fantastic penetration nice thick wire for musky this is probably my favorite kind of musky hook i'm going to show you how to do a variation on paul monaghan's mono rig really it is his rig i just straight up stole this uh, for doing replaceable rattles i'm going to talk about rattle size and an idea that i have but i can't really prove that any of that is just a fun thing to think about <clears throat> same as the imposter your material dams are going to be sf blend uh, and we're going to tie this in fire tiger. So we're going, we're going perch, but I want a nice white belly. Your wings over top of that for your length and silhouette are going to be big fly fiber straight. Again, a round fiber, so low friction. Stiffness relative to length so that you have good movement without falling. It's also unbelievably durable. We're going to veil that with flash. This is a, a green pearl, so it's, it's not like super pearl. It's got some nice tone to it, and then a marine green. So we're going to kind of fade that from lighter to darker as we move throughout the fly. And then the head is going to be strong fuzzy fiber. Dun, 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 dun. My favorite head material of all time. <laughs> we're going to blend that uh, with some varying colors of wing and flash to make it fairly complex. 
the eyes are going to be 3 8 sticker eyes. Now that's pretty critical because we want to keep the head of the fly light so that it helps suspend the pattern. Um, and you have different hook options here. So when you tie it the way I'm going to demo it, <coughs> we're going to tie the head just with strung fuzzy fiber, sticker eyes, leave it. The reason is, is I want it to be as light as possible to reduce any kind of head dip, right? So we're going to tie a nice high friction head. We're not going to coat it. We're not going to make it slippery. Uh, we're going to put on sticker eyes, which are going to be the lightest option available to us, right? Trying to reduce nose weight. Um, if you wanted to do a silicone head, one of those kind of glue heads, a nice bulky head that you would structure with, say, silicone, uh, to really make it slippery and try to trap an air pocket and get different action out of the fly, I would move to a TP610, which I have right here. <clears throat> then you can see it's a much wider gap took. And so with the TP610, a little bit thinner wire, uh, the wider gap gives it a little bit more spring, but that's gonna allow you to put a full-size glue head without uh, kind of impeding your hook point. On the stinger hooks, I'm gonna run just a, a glueless head with just sticker eyes. So that's everything you need to know. Um, the last thing I'll talk about before we tie the fly is this is a momentum train fly. I think I mentioned that earlier. I don't know if I did or not. But the whole premise of the fly is it's a mega jerk. <laughs> it's supposed to swim kind of like a jerk bait with profile shells, which is obviously something that can be uh, a huge trigger mechanism for ambush style species, right? Because you're presenting them with the perfect opportunity, full profile show, grab and attack and stun and later eat the, the bait, right? If they're always chasing it, they don't really have a great opportunity, you turn that thing broadside and boom. And the way it works, the reason why we're running two six aughts, which seems heavy, I'm also going to weight them uh, a little bit per Mark Sadati, uh, weight balancing also to improve the, the keel and the momentum train principles here. Uh, but what happens is, is that front hook is basically going to slow down. It's got all the friction on it. It's, it's the one disturbing all the water. The rear hook isn't small. It's not light. It's not designed to be some little wispy trout bug, right? We're trying to get a mechanical movement out of the pattern. This isn't necessarily about swim, so you have to think differently. So we have a heavy gauge rear hook with a rattle on the rear hook. We're using the same size, six out, which is like 1.4 grams, maybe even heavier, 1.5, it's pretty heavy. And then we're gonna weight it. And so what happens is as that head slows down, it's kind of like a semi-truck with a trailer, the semi-truck locks up on the brakes and the trailer jackknifes into that fly and then it gets pulled off to the side, right? So it's absolutely critical that you understand why we're using two six outs, why it's a heavy gauge wire, why we're putting the rattle in the back, why we're gonna weight both of them. The front one's weighted for proper tracking. The rear one is weighted for rear mass, like a fully loaded trailer. So the momentum train carries it forward, turns the whole system, provides you with a perfect opportunity to present a bait to an ambush style species. Hopefully you can see them and read their behavior, engage them, and then kill it off to the side. Now one nuance to this, to get the best turn I will add in a fishing context, has to be a slackless system. <clears throat> Now that might sound a little bit awkward because you want slack to the fly to get it to turn, so let me uh, explain what I mean. <clears throat> your rod tip position relative to the fly has to reduce as much slack as possible, meaning your rod tip can't be up above the water and it can't be off to the side. You want to point it at water level right at the fly that you're fishing, right, so that you don't have any line bow because when you have bow in your line and you strip it, it'll kick up and then relax and kick up and relax. And that relaxing sagging puts tension on the nose of the fly so that it doesn't turn. Now with the fully weighted fly the way it is, when your line isn't sagging, you stop the line on your strip, the line stops. Now the fly can move forward and it has the slack it needs to have the proper movement. But if you have a sag in your line, you have your rod tip high above the water, when you strip that thing, that line jumps tight and then relaxes in a bow, <clears throat> you strip that line, it darts forward, stops, and then sags. And so that fly can never create the necessary freedom to actually move itself left or right. So that's one nuance to fishing a jerk fly that's critical that you understand and you'll retrieve so that you can get it to get eaten. So enough talking. That's a long intro. Let me show you the rigging. <clears throat> and yeah. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to weight both hooks more or less the same. 
Um, and I'm going to bring out the gram scale here just so that we are all on the same page and you guys uh, can deviate from this however you'd like. But we're going to use the two 6 out TP, uh, the two 6 out PR320s. Those are 1.4 grams each. I'm going to come in with a 4 millimeter glass rattle. I'll talk about uh, rattle size in a second in relation to an idea that I had, but that's 0.35. So it's a significant amount of weight. That's not nothing, right? Then I'm going to come off with about four inches of lead. This is 030 lead wire. And I'm going to do one of those. It's 0.7 grams. We're going to do two of those, one on each hook. And what we're going to do is we're going to keel the hooks on top of the fact that it's already a thick wire six out. Uh, because we have a pretty bulky, beefy head, I really want that sucker to track true. Um, and when you put a keel like this, you can fish that fly ridiculously fast in a lot of current and what you're going to get is belly wobble which is seductive it, it fools fish because they like that it looks wounded right uh, i don't want my flies basically ever to ride on their side so i'm going to put keel weight on this entire bend four inches is a good amount and with that 0 0.7 0 0.7 1.4 is basically like fishing three hooks at 1.4 which would be 2.8 which would be 4.2 4.2 grams total which is going to be pretty dang awesome uh, for fishing an 11 inch synthetic fly with a big bushy head it's going to cast really really nice so <clears throat> just get that in there so i'm going to take my my six outs both of them because we're going to do the same thing to both of them get it in my vise i'm going to take a little hackle plier here and just kind of cheat and hang on to my lead wire i'm going to put it just below the bend to get it started here And I'm just going to wrap that down my hook bend. And obviously, as you go down that bend, the farther away you get from your, your tying axis, the more leverage that weight has. <clears throat> and when I get about halfway, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to come up on itself so that the lower section has got the most leverage. So it's just like that, nice fat section right in the middle, right there, and then I just touch that with some zap just to give it a little bit of grab on there. Now this is something you can play with after you finish the fly, move all the materials out, wrap it on there. Obviously you don't, won't necessarily be able to glue it uh, super efficiently without making a mess on things, but it's something you can play with even on a finished fly, it's just waiting that bend. So I'm gonna wait the other one, and then I'll show you guys how to rig up the mono rig and put a replaceable rattle on that. So all I got is a tube. <clears throat> this is large rigid tubing by HMH. Got my four millimeter glass rattle. I'm just gonna get some thread wraps on that guy and tie it straight to my tube. This is a rigging uh, that I'm borrowing from Paul Monaghan. If you're not familiar with Paul, he's got a wonderful YouTube channel Flashtail Predator Flies. Actually, it might be his name. Oh, that's his business name. And it has some wonderful pike and muskie flies and saltwater patterns and a lot of Bob Pavlovich's inspired bucktail work. And it's well worth viewing if you don't already. This is a style of rigging he came up with called a mono rig. It uses monofilament uh, extended back into basically a weedless Texas style hook. And on that mono rigging, <clears throat> he does something with removable, replaceable tubes. And it's absolutely ingenious. And what you do, or at least what I'm doing here, is you take a rattle, a glass rattle or a plastic rattle, whatever rattles you prefer, you tie it on a tube, and then it allows you to thread that onto some monofilament. Now, let me show you exactly what's going on here. So I used a fast snatch. I'll put this in the vise here. And so what you have is just a mono extended body. You have a fast snatch attachment, which is closing a loop here, which I can thread on and off. Now when it's threaded off, I can take my rattle off in case it breaks, or if I want to change sizes and put a new one on, just like that, and then take my fast snatch. There we go. <clears throat> and so that goes in that mono loop and stops that tube from being able to slide out and it locks that rattle in place. Now, <clears throat> before I rig this up, 
The idea is really simple. Uh, it seems like when people tie with rattles, the bigger the fly gets, the bigger the rattle gets. It seems pretty intuitive. You got larger hook, you can kind of accommodate more weight and still have it be very castable and friendly. Obviously a larger pattern, if it makes larger noise, it's kind of desirable. Uh, but something about really big rattles, aside from getting attention, are also fairly obnoxious. <laughs> and I had an idea, and it's just an idea, it's nothing uh, that I can prove or anything, uh, but it seemed like it would be super slick to run small rattles, like a three millimeter rattle or a four millimeter rattle, on a really big fly so that the sound is very, not obnoxious, but almost intriguing. And what you have to understand about water is that obviously those sound waves travel so well to the point where even we could hear them. If you stud your head, stuck your head underwater and shook a rattle, you'd hear that thing clear as day. And you're not even a fish designed to eat things underwater. So uh, I'm playing with small rattles on big flies. I think it's a very intriguing thing so that the rattle is not obnoxious, but it's more inquisitive and investigating and, and friendly to the fish to check it out without in your face kind of cracking. So. I love it, sounds sweet. So to rig it up proper, coming in with eight thousandths of an inch, 0.2 millimeter uh, monofilament thread. Get that started, wrap back over yourself, make sure you got zero slippage, wrap it down. Cut that sucker off of there. And all I'm gonna do is, I got that tube tied on there. Right about there is fine. I'm gonna come in with one of my mono straights. This is, uh, what is it, 28 thousandths of an inch, 60 pound. I'm gonna have quite a bit of waste with this, but that's okay. I'm gonna take my tube here, which is absolutely coated in super glue, and I'm definitely gonna super glue my fingers together. Slide that down the way. I'm gonna come in with a glass bead for spacing. Slide that down the way. Then I'm gonna have just kind of a, a little hoop in the back where that fast snatch is gonna go. And just kind of lock that in place if I need to switch. Just wanna make sure there's really no twist in it, but I guess it doesn't matter that much. And then just rip that thing into place. And then I'm just gonna lock that thing into place. And if you make it a little bit long, what's nice is I'll be able to accommodate a five millimeter glass rattle, a three millimeter glass rattle. I can add more uh, tires, glass beads to fill up that space as I need it. Come in with a plastic fly rattle so I can try all the varying sizes of rattles, see if they like the smaller size or the larger size. And on top of that, I can change the weight behind the fly in the momentum chain, make it heavier or lighter, and get more or less kick which is pretty sweet. Now I'm gonna grab a fast snatch and thread it through there before we keep going. Now the acronym for these are, is fast ATCH, like fast attachment, fast snatch. Fast attachment is what it stands for. And now that is locked into place, not going anywhere. And I have a removable, replaceable rattle. Now I'm gonna come in here and we're gonna start tying this fly finally. <laughs> and I'm gonna run through it uh, as thoroughly as I can. All right, first thing we need is a material dam. Coming in with SF Blend. A nice S crinkle material, so it's gonna build volume. It's got waves in it. It's literally crimped so that they fight each other. Moderate stiffness. And what you're gonna do for your tail, is you're gonna take that out of full length out of the package and cut it roughly into thirds. Why my scissors have some static on them, I don't know. And then <clears throat> those tips, you just kind of pull them and move them around so that they're not flush. And you want tapered edges, not flush edges. Now, when you come and tie this in, there's kind of two ways to do it. And you're gonna see a very big difference in how I manipulate the big fly fiber versus the SF because the SF is in a fairly big bundle. Now, what you can do with the bundle is you can just lay it on top and physically drape it around the hook. Catch that with some loose thread. Pinch it, pinch it, pinch it so it's nice and even. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start wrapping back with touching turns and make a valley. And this valley is going to allow me to trap all this material twice in a very clean bullet style format that's going to take basically the durability of this fly to its maximum capacity. And so that is your initial kind of core of the dubbing brush, if you will, the Mega Drip brush that we're going to use to veil and really lift, provide the lift for the big fly fiber. Now I'm going to coat each little stage with super glue. I'll probably skip that if I can. I'll include it if I'm running my mouth. <laughs> so just know that I do that between each stage and that the, the nylon monofilament thread with these nylon synthetics with CA plus super glue all kicks and welds and melts together and makes something truly bulletproof. It's, it's pretty remarkable how durable it is. Now I'm going to come in with my big fly fiber straight. Fairly wispy. Because it's so wispy, it's kind of hard uh, to apply. Now that's at full length off the hank, straight out of the packaging. And you're going to come up here and just taper these tips so that again, no flush edges. Now you got to comb out those tips. And you're going to start at the bottom, work your way up into the middle so you don't see any knots. Now you have a nice kind of tapered fiber. And this is going to set the length of my fly, which it'll probably go back a full seven inches. We're going to do a nice flash tail. So I have 70 30, if you will coming off of here. Now because this is a lot thinner density compared to my SF blend, I tend to trap this all in one spot on the top, followed by a thumbnail that then manipulates it around and then you just kind of pinch and rip and pinch and twist and really just try to move it. And I like to move it under a little bit of thread pressure. You see my, my hand never really lets go of my bobbin and that gives it control so it doesn't just slip or fly all over the place but I can really just work it slowly. Again Thread Valley and because we're tying it in twice and it's synthetic I can let go of that bobbin coming with a push tool. Now this tool has uh, some grooved edges in it that really help control these synthetics. You have absolute 100% control it helps to force the fibers straight back over themselves and not twist around so you're going to get a reciprocal kind of equal density that you applied to the fiber in the first place and again bullet tie maximum durability and that is essentially when we do this in the back and the front we'll have the same form and function as simply wrapping a dubbing brush forward it's obviously uh, more time consuming but you can do it <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is those dubbing brushes had flash and the cool thing was it built the flash flash symmetric symmetrically in the round as the fly move forward as the brush progressed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to veil all this with some polar flash. Now polar flash has some pros and cons to it. In my opinion it's the fishiest flash. It has the best fish catching uh, kind of attributes but it can get teased out. It can get broken fairly easily and it gets stuck in fish teeth. So I have a solution for you here that I'll share once I start applying this. And that's about as long as I can make it. As we go forward, I'll start to taper it a little bit, but for right now in the back, it's as long as I can make it. I'll just roughly trap that. This, of all the things, this one does not need to be clean. <clears throat> as in like tight and neatly. That's what they mean when you tie something clean. Tight and neat, doesn't need to be neat. Uh, but polar flash, what you wanna do <clears throat> is it's literally flashable that has nylon woven. And so that weave will trap predator teeth and get stuck. And if they get stuck, it allows them to really break it out, which is kind of unfortunate. You can see I'm starting closer to the tail, moving my way up, and then finally starting at the head. And I'm only going to show you this once because typically I'll do all of this once the fly's done. And what these fine bristles do is they go in. Of course, they pick out the SF. And they make everything nice and neat. They make all the fibers align. This is what you want to do if you're going to take some pretty pictures of your flies here <clears throat> but it also unweaves the nylon and it leaves the flash the polar flash uh, so that it doesn't get stuck in fish teeth but it also has the memory of that nylon so it's not a flat matte fiber but it has really nice texture to it that is ultra realistic it's really unbelievable in the water 
Now we're going to do a flash tail, just like on the Imposter. Flash tails, my favorite flash is going to be Magnum Flash. It's going to be the longest, it's going to be wide and thick, so it's going to be extremely durable. It's going to be less prone to following, and at that length, stiffness relative to length, it's going to be very limp in the back, but it's not going to give us any trouble here. Now the flash tail is just a style of tying that has proven itself over and over again for e-socks, especially <laughs> it's, it's just a phenomenal way to tie fly. Um, so I'm going to come in. I have bronze, which is a nice matte color. I got like four of them. I'm going to come in pretty heavy with some gold here, another four strands of gold. And then I'm going to come in with, I think it's just called green. But it's a very, like, uh, maybe it's called Sharpie. Maybe it's called Sharpie. Or it's called Sapphire, because it is actually Sapphire. <laughs> Let's go with Sapphire. Now, anyway, that's at full length, which is redonkulously long. I'm going to fold that in half, cut it. I'm just going to twist it into my fingers so that I don't have all the same colors on one side. I'm going to finger taper that so my edges are not flush. I'm going to lay that basically as long as I can to match the length of my big fly fiber. I'm going to pin it straight to the top. And then I'm going to shove my thumbnail into it, but I'm not trying to work it around the hook. I'm just trying to get it to veil the back, but not the belly. Wrap that veil backwards so that it seats the way I set it. And then stack that on top of itself. And that's going to be your flash tail dressing. And then we're just going to run forward here. And rinse and repeat that process, just like the imposter. So I'm coming in with SF. As these material dams progress, they're just going to get stiffer, or not stiffer, <laughs> denser, which the density will increase the stiffness, but the goal is to get them denser. Now obviously you want more build and more bulk. So I'm going to come and I'm going to cut that into thirds again, so we're matching the proportions here for this back hook. This time I have more fibers. Again, I'm going to tease out the tips. I'm going to comb them out after teasing them to apply that taper. I'm going to make it nice and wide, which is going to be easy to mash that around my hook. It's approximately 50-50 to where my thread's going to catch it. If you need to come up and get a clean pinch on this, you can see my thread's pretty good. So check this out. I'm going to spin this clockwise. And as I come up, it's going to be, oh, it's gross. It's way over here. I can barely, can barely control that. So what you do is you spin counterclockwise. You spin towards your hand counterclockwise. And as you come up, look at that tight pinch. I got all the control in the world. Nice loose wrap, two or three loose wraps. Just kind of move it around, make sure it's very even. Seat that hard, make a thread valley, fold it back. You want those fibers going 90 degrees straight over themselves, bending straight backwards. Tight bullet tie for maximum durability. And you can just kind of pick that out. <clears throat> now, it's okay if your big fly fiber is sparse on that tail because the whole back hook is basically the tail. So you're going to be able to fill it in with the next stack and fill it in with the next stack. You want all the layers to add up to the fly. If you put all the, <laughs> if you put all the fly in the first layer, you're going to have a grossly overdressed fly. Now, again, this is at full length. And what you want to do with this stuff is you always just want to hold it up and get the taper you want. Like this is, you know, two inches short of my previous material. If I put some taper into that, I'll get some nice bleeding, and that's where I'm gonna tie it in. It happens to be about 60%, 40%. So you just intuitively know if you need to shorten it or lengthen it or use it at full length or do whatever so that your proportions are all matchy-matchy. So I'm gonna be able to, a little bit long, check it, perfect. Catch it right on top, two or three wraps, thumbnail right into that aggressively move that around. This is not just dainty stuff. Like you should, my fingers hurt from that hook eye. Get in there and move it. Get a nice smooth veil, wrap back to that thread bump. I created a nice thread valley. Gonna control that big fly fiber with a little push tool. And then I'm gonna get a clean bullet tie. That's gonna reverse all that fiber make the most durable fly ever and that 
now my fiber density looks appropriate for a fully dressed fly because I had to use both sections here. Now again, I'm gonna veil that with my polar flash. So this is that green pearl, starting light, fading to dark towards the head. Like everything else on the fly, finger taper that sucker. And I'm gonna tie that in, probably 70-30-ish, just so that I'm starting to build taper because the, the back stack was as long as I could get it. Now I can start kind of keeping it closer to the hook here. And what you can do is just keep the long stacks on top double it all on the bottom and keep the short stacks on the bottom. You just want to make sure that you fan it out once you trap it. Now on the rear, I'm just going to put in one single SF wing. This is going to help uh, keel this back hook, not that it needs any help with all that lead on the, the bend there, but originally that lead wasn't there. So this helped keel the original back hook. It's basically a stabilizer wing, but for more practical purposes, it's also gonna counter shade the fly, literally toning the back. So I'm gonna come in with some peacock, which is a nice kind of olive with UV kind of textures into it. I'm gonna put a fairly long little taper to it, apply that taper down going to come in a little bit longer. I need a little bit more fibers. <clears throat> yeah, that's better. So you can see that goes probably, you know, 70% down the back. I'm just going to stack that. So I'm literally going to get my thread over top of it, just like that. Put my fingers on the underside and lock it in so that it can't really rotate. And you can see I don't really need to be at the hook eye like in a you know a super traditional clean sense like it's not what is important with the streamer is the finished product you know it's not whether or not I have that section between the things dressed and I got material all the way from back to forward what matters is the silhouettes the action the taper not the dressing of every square inch of that hook shank it, doesn't make a difference. So if that doesn't look clean, it doesn't matter <laughs> because the finished product looks clean and the finished product has the right silhouette. So that's what to take home from that is. And that is your back hook of a truly mega jerk fly. Right there. It's basically an imposter without the head, right? It's literally the same thing. And now we're going to articulate that and do it again. So I'm coming in with my front hook, which likewise has the key weight on there. Same tying thread and everything. Really make sure there's no slippage in that thread. Now for articulation, I'm going to let you guys kind of do whatever you want. I'm, I'm, I change this up all the time and kind of just see what fails and what doesn't fail. I don't know. Sometimes I use 90 pound 7x7, seven seven. sometimes I use nylon coated. That's 24 thousandths of an inch. Sometimes I use single strand. That's like 180 pound and bend it into a Bill Shear style shank. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to take some lighter wire. It's only probably 30 pound bite wire, but I'm going to use two strands because I feel like it. <laughs> and so I'm not going to walk you guys through this part because this is something I kind of just experiment with at the moment. And so it's not something that you should necessarily imitate. But anything. Basically what you want, stainless steel. If you have nylon coated stainless steel, that's even better because that nylon is going to grip with my nylon thread and plastic weld itself together so it's never gonna pull out. Basically the, the failure rate is gonna be how much stress the wire can take being jackknifed back and forth if that back hook is your primary hook. So that's gonna be kind of your failure determination. 30 pound wire. With a nylon coating, what's kind of nice is I won't need to run it through the hook eye because I have a full shank to lash it down. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to lash it down uh, going, oh, I guess I'll walk you guys through it. I'll just skip certain steps here. So it's vague but helpful. <clears throat> so if you wanted to try this, 
what you're going to see is I literally have both strands on top. So kind of one strand's on one side, the other strand is on the other side. And so they split the difference. And again, I'm going to be able to really trust the connection, as in it's never going to pull out because it's nylon on nylon, and I just, it's such a rough base, and I can pull so freaking hard with that um, monofilament tying thread. I can really pull really, really hard. I'm just going to grab some glass beads. I say that, but I'm failing miserably to get them. Just functionally going to move that rear hook a little bit farther back. And all I'm going to do here, we'll just thread these on. One, two, three. These are large glass beads. Of course, you can use plastic beads. You can tie these things right next to each other. Uh, the goal is to just kind of have a nice, hard, flexible loop in the back for the hook to move freely in and articulate in. Now I'm going to take that one strand. I'm going to put him on the one side, put you on the other side. Now I'm just going to be able to pull those taut once I get my hook off that thing. So I just have them kind of going down. I'm going to be able to pull them taut. I'm going to catch that with some loose thread here. Hold that under tension and then pull back so that they slip into equal kind of rolls. They each have, you know, 50% of that hook weight there. <clears throat> so you can see we've even though that was kind of vague, I didn't really want to give you too many tips there because I'm just playing with an idea here. But you can see I have a nice vertical loop in the back that is free for that hook eye to move and jackknife in. Of course, it's going to fail up here, right? But that's why I have four strands going either way all the way to that hook, trying to maximize that durability, even though I'm using a thinner, lighter, limper wire. So. The key components there are what really matter. Vertical loop, sideways articulation, nice and stiff, freedom for that hook eye. So now we're getting to the fun stuff because what we're going to do is we're going to incorporate body tubing. Now this is basically a woven nylon <coughs> developed, uh, well it has other cross applications, but Blaine brought it to market with Flyman for his T-bone. And what you're going to want is, I kind of forget the length I use but it's a vague amount, about that. That looks like the perfect length. Let me help you out here. So if that's one, that's one and three quarter, one and three quarter inch long section. Let's see if that's right. Tie that in here. It's gonna be a tad long. I'm gonna make a big thread valley there. Come in with a lighter, melt that nylon together. Shove your finger into burning, melting nylon. It feels moderately warm. <laughs> uh, it's a little bit long. <clears throat> so let's go back to about an inch and a half. Let's try that. Melt that again. Flare it up. And I'm going to trust that. So uh, I cut it to an inch and a half was the final length there. Get some super glue on that. So again, it plastic welds. Flip that back over itself and draw it up onto your thread base. Really lash that down. And then you're going to come up with a nice half hitch whip finish. And what we're using this for is obviously to create more volume while maintaining the same material set because the SF is only going to be able to build so much volume in bulk. And this is going to allow us to flare that SF to an extreme level to then support more big fly fiber to create the necessary silhouette. And what's kind of cool, and this wasn't uh, intentional in the design, but if you look at it kind of after the fact, it's basically an articulated version of Blaine's synthetic T-bone, which is a just ridiculously sweet pattern that has a removable rear stinger hook. And you can basically tie that fly I think you'd need a SF brush to do it the way he does it. Uh, but you can basically tie that fly with this same material set. And so I um, highly recommend it if you haven't and you're serious about streamer tying, that you check out Blaine's new book, which is obviously Game Changer, which is the style of fly that he designed. Right? And it has so many cross applications. But 
the synthetic T-bone. This is basically a, a variation of that unintentionally, but it is nonetheless. Now I'm going to come in with SF Blend. Looks like I'm going to need a new bag here. I'm going to come in pretty thick, and this time I'm going to treat it in half. So I'm going to cut it only in half, not thirds. So we increase the length here, get a little bit more veiling towards that back hook. I got some loose ends here that are a little bit too loose. And again, I'm just going to treat this all the same, make it nice and wide. Get it on there, come up with some loose thread if you need to. Spin that sucker counterclockwise so you can get a really clean catch towards that body tubing. Flare and flare. Let's get that packed in there so it's even. And now I can create a nice thread base, thread bump, that goes back to that body tubing. It's going to be a little tricky to catch it here. I should be able to get that to come down right on that base. And that is going to give me all the volume I need to support truly that big fly fiber wing. Now something that you'll see if you go to my web shop is I only carry that body tubing in the quarter inch. I think it's kind of the most useful size. I also only carry it in clear because I, I don't really use it as a head anymore. I'd much prefer to, to stack and pack synthetics. Uh, but as an under material supporting all this stuff, it's perfect just in clear because it kind of goes with every fly. That's why it's in clear because I always use it as a material dam. <clears throat> so coming in with the taper that I want, about halfway down the, the back fly, that's going to be close. I am going to trim off about an inch just so I can get my finger taper and I think it'll all bleed together a little bit better. And I'm going to stack this more or less 50-50. Let's see if it's 60-40 or not. Yeah, about 60-40 I suppose, but it doesn't have as much taper as that rear hook. You're just going to pack that all into that one spot reef your fingers into it, your fingernail right on top of that tying thread. Super glue some of it to your thumb. <laughs> Ignore that. Down at the bottom, because you're wrapping it around, it'll tend to get jackknifed around where your thread splits it. You can see I have just a little valley there where my thread came across on top of the material. That just happens when you trap it. So make sure you kind of fill in that little valley. Nice even distribution. Walk it back to our veil system. And again, we're going to use two of these. It's just like the tail in that your density, it needs to be a total of the sums. You need to be able to take both parts of your material dam to generate the fly. So each material dam itself should be very, very sparse and light and limp because there's going to be a second one that's going to fill it in. So everything has to be summed when you're doing this. You can't just off the cuff tie it super, super thick because with all the stages, it'd be very easy to overdress something that is nuanced in its layering. So now I'm going to come in with the marine green, go into our darker polar flash here. I'm going to go heavy. going to fill that in the same length as the big fly fiber. My thread had some memory to it so I'm going to spin counterclockwise and get that memory out. I'm going to trap just kind of vaguely all the tall fibers on the back and all the short ones on the belly just to save me some time here. And then I'm going to wrap that on top of that big fly fiber bump. Put down a layer of super glue. <clears throat> Come back in with your next layer of body tubing here. Slide that over, lock that in place, take that lighter, you're going to fuse these tips together so that the whole thing doesn't unwind and then while it's melted, melting I suppose, while it's melting you shove your finger into it to force it over. Now that's going to be just perfect, again it was about an inch and a half. Super glue so that the nylon likes itself and welds right into place. Just pretend for a second that this is still white. And again, it's, it's moving forward. It's getting denser and denser and denser. 
pick those tips out, make it nice and wide, wrap that on, counterclockwise twist, accurate catch. I'll even use my finger to kind of hold the loop against the hook shank there because I just lost control of everything. Let me see how we did here. Kind of in a, a rush against my camera batteries at the moment. So this is making a pretty nasty thread valley and I'm going to do my best to work with it because I don't really have the time to fix it at the moment. So I'm going to use that thread valley to my advantage. <clears throat> Come up and measure that big fly fiber off, get some taper in there. You can see I'm going to cut off about two inches so I can get the taper that I want. And again, because these are synthetics, you can obviously come in and trim the final silhouette, which I'll probably do. Come up here and make sure that's just a wee bit shorter. Tie it in about 60-40. Lock that right on top of that bump right there and start spreading it around as even as you can get it. Coming with that push tool. And now again, the summation of the hole here, you got summation of the parts. You got a nice tapering of all this layering together. And you have that orange front bleeding into that yellow tail. Super aggressive, but all the, everything just fades really quite perfectly into each other. <clears throat> again, I'm gonna come in with that polar flash make it nice and pretty intense up here in the front. I'm going to tie it in basically 50-50. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get that on the top, veil it out with my thumbnail a little bit, wrap that back, pull it up to the underside, and repeat that process. Because that's going to be way easier than moving that around in the round on top of all this fiber. And take a pretty thick SF wing, put some taper into it, and that's going to be my back here. Really counter shade that fly. I need even quite a bit more. Maybe it's a good thing I pulled that whole stack out. I'm going to end up using most of it. And this is just going to be high tie, low tie. Really simple. Get it on top. Put it just a little bit of a veil into it and then make a thread valley and then put it back over top of itself so it's really tied in just like everything but it's just really maintained aggressively under the top of the hook. Now we're going to be able to tame and kind of tone all that crazy hot orange. Again this would originally be white but I'm going to come in this is called mullet brown this is going to be way, way thinner uh, than that top stack. I'm going to cut it just about two or three inches short and retaper it. I do not want this super thick. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to V tie this. So I'm going to wrap that around my bobbin, trap that, and you'll see I'll just, it's like catching it 50 50. I got some going forward, some going back. I'm going to take this section leaning back, trap that down, take this leaning forward pull it back and you'll see it'll make a nice little V moving around and splitting that hook point. Shove my thumbnail into that and I'm just, it's a different way to manipulate that fiber for basically a high tie, low tie. My thread slipped off there, get back on there. There we go. Just a different way to manipulate that fiber. And then I can literally just pull it where I want it. Make sure I got clean colors and everything else. But that's going to be a, a very shapeable, sculptable belly here in just a second. And I'll show you how to trim it all up once I got the head finished. 
So I'm going to come in and super glue that. And then we're going to stack our strung fuzz head and trim everything up to perfection. Now I'm going to come in with my strung fuzzy fiber. I have like a green olive on top. I'm going to do cream for the belly because again they have white bellies even though they're typically looking with that orange and yellow. And I'm going to blend that with vague colors of wing and flesh. It's not important. And so <clears throat> the way I'm going to treat this fiber, just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to take it off the hank at the full length of the hank. I'm going to come in and I'm going to cut that into half, cut that into quarters. That is my working length. This will essentially be my rear stack and my front stack. I don't have a lot of room. I might do it all in one stack. We'll see when the time gets there. So that's my working length, a quarter of the full hank, uh, and it's pretty darn sparse because I have all this volume already. I don't need it to create volume. I just need to be able to sculpt it and get my eyes on there. So that's what we're doing. So I'll just include this for the briefest second here, but this is called rip stacking. It's how I'm blending the wing and flash with the strong fuzzy fiber. You just rip it up, put it back in your pile. I ended up doing the, the green olive with dark brown and lime. And it looks sick. It really does. So I'm gonna take that bundle <clears throat> pull that in half, take that strong fuzz, catch it super duper close here to that SF stack, just on top, move to the bottom, take my cream, which I blended with fluorescent yellow, so we're going to have a really nice kind of pale, but visible, very visible, and kind of true to that perchy color scheme anyway, tone there. I'm basically just trying to get those trapped in. I got a ton of thread pressure on here, like a ton of thread pressure on here. Coming up to that hook eye, veil those back. I just don't have a lot of room. That's gonna be okay. So I'm just gonna thin that out just a little bit here. Gonna come in with another stack on the back. Really get that so it's gonna be right on top. It didn't need to be this technical, but it's turning out to be this technical. This is what you call crowding the eye. <laughs> uh, classic. Anyway, gonna get that just locked in place there. <clears throat> now, this six ot, luckily for me, it's got a nice big eye. So I'm gonna be able to get all that, tame it all back. I got more material top and bottom, which is gonna allow me to shape it and sculpt it and do whatever I need to. Get my half hitch in there. Get my whip finish in there. I'm gonna pinch and pull those color combos to the sides here so that I got a nice clean color separation. And then I'm gonna comb all that out this craziness. <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the head shape with super glue. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to pull that back really hard. And I'm basically just gluing my thread wraps. It's not like a, a ridiculous amount of glue on here. I couldn't find there's my bodkin that I was looking for. And you see that glue, it sets up real quick into that strung fuzz and it sets that angle back nearly perfectly. You don't need UV or, or any extra product or anything that takes a long time. You just pull that back hard, let it move up into the head and it wants to go in there. And you can see, even though I crowded that eye, I have a very big hook eye here. So it's not, I saved it. <laughs> That's what you're looking at. Now, this thing is crazy. Let's look at this thing. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna come in. I just have it lightly in my vise, so it might move around on me. I'm not really trying to lock it in place here. I'm just going to sculpt and shape that head to get the angle and profile that I want. And the nice thing about this strung fuzz is it will hold whatever shape basically you give it in the water. So I can make a nice beefy three-dimensional head 
That's not just going to collapse and lay down. What you don't want your heads to lay down. Fish heads are solid anyway. Might as well get the most bang for your buck and make it three dimensional. Sick. Look at that thing. That's sick. All right. Now what we're going to do, <coughs> two things. One, we're going to put, obviously, some vertical stripes on this bad boy because perch have bars. Second, I'm going to come in with glue and eyes. Uh, I'm going to do the marker first just so I can grab and manipulate the fiber and I don't got to worry about bumping the eyes. I'm going to come in with a black chart pack marker. This is an alcohol-based marker. It's not going to last forever, but it does a pretty darn good job of toning the material and staying nice and toned. And what you're going to see is a lot of time I'm going to rub it into place. Now, I don't have, you know, an airbrush kit or anything fancy for this. Just touch it up the side, and what I like to do, for consistency's sake, just make a line. Literally just make a line on that thing. And what you can do is you come all the way down here, and you have to get good at spacing it out. Which takes practice, and this is one of those things that it's okay to mess up anyway. Doesn't matter much. You're just breaking up that silhouette. You see I'm just sectioning it off. One little bit at a time, make sure you don't color up your vise. And now I can go through and turn those into little wedges that are wider at the top, thinner at the bottom. Nothing too fancy. You don't need an airbrush kit or anything like that. Oh, that was unsightly. I didn't see that big fly fiber hanging down there. How dare it. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in. We got our 3 eighths of an inch sticker eyes. Again, the sticker eyes keep it light. They keep it lightweight. They keep all the head uh, as best you can to get that head to suspend. And what you're going to do is just put a pretty big dab, about the size of the black pupil, is right there on the fiber. And you don't really want to work it into the fiber, because the first thing you want to contact that is the eye. You're going to come in here with that eye. If you need to be delicate, you can put the eye on a bodkin, like so, and get your bodkin off the eye by rotating it and then pushing that down into the fiber. Preen this one up, get that one on my bodkin, get my bodkin on that glue, and then push that glue down into that head. And that is just to hold that eye in place. Now, it won't last forever. If you wanted it to last forever, you'd dome it with UV resin and maybe coat it in silicone and do all these things that are going to make it heavier. Just hold it on there as a nice spot. So, switched cameras here because my GoPro died. Uh, what you're going to want to do is just sit here and kind of babysit those eyes for a second. Just keep uh, pushing them into that head. Uh, just like once. Come back in 10 minutes and push on those eyes. Uh, they'll take a little bit to cure up. But that right there is your articulated mega jerk. Nice full size. This one's probably close to 11 inch direction changing glide bait. Synthetic. Uses the same materials as the Imposter. So you get kind of a lot of bang for your buck with that one. Uh, same materials basically as the All Spark and Bulkhead All Spark. It's three dimensionally sound. Nice big beefy head to it. Head still high and tight. You can make it basically as bulky as you want because we got all that keel weight on the bend of that six shot not only on the front also the back hook which has a stabilizing wing which has a nice rattle in it that's also replaceable so that is your fire look at that thing that's your fire tiger mega jerk basically a variation on Blaine chocolates t-bone this would be like a, a synthetic articulated t-bone and just kind of a complete accident but I guess a happy accident. So, nice 
things. She's favoring that, that side. Ooh, that was a jackknife. So just a few things to keep in mind about testing flies in a bathtub. Uh, don't, you know, tie it to a rod tip and move the thing around because you can't do that in the water. You make a 50 foot cast, the only thing you can do to a fly is pull it straight at yourself. So I have, you know, the bathtub filled up about as high as I can. He flicked that fly out and I use one hand to push my leader material down to the water surface so everything's at the same level, and then a hard strip. And that's how you can gauge, you know, a hard strip or a soft strip or a smooth acceleration to a stop and see how that fly behaves. And you can really get that thing to really jackknife off to the left there. So few things to know uh, but thanks for watching hopefully you guys find that useful it's a sick little fly cast like a dream you can jackknife it when you want with a nice hard strip it's pretty slick so thanks for watching check it out tie some up catch you in the next one